rise and fall. Kingdoms were strong and shaken, but we trust forever in your name. In the name of Jesus. We trust the name of
You are so lovely. Lord, we just offer you all that we are, Lord, and we know that you tell us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Lord, that everything that we do, the way that we think, our actions throughout the week, not just when we're here in this building singing songs and and reading the Bible, Lord, but in everything that we do, when we go home, when we go to work, when we are busy about our business, Lord, that everything that we do would magnify your name, that we would be a light in the darkness, that you would um, just give us opportunities to speak your truth into this world that is so full of confusion, Lord. And we just thank you that, as we sang in the beginning, that you are the firm foundation, the rock that we stand on, Lord. We know who you are and who we are in you, and I just pray that you would continue to speak your truth to us this morning, that you would remind us of things that we may have forgotten, that you would teach us new things that we've never seen before, 
that you would uh, convict us where necessary, Lord, that you would encourage us and just draw us closer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take a second and say hi to somebody. everyone. Hope you guys are having a wonderful day so far. I know it's early. Uh, I'm going to move my notes aside here because we are going to have someone come up and speak a little bit this morning besides me. Uh, but first, we're going to do announcements. Um, just to let you guys know, uh, I told you last week Pastor Brett uh, did not have COVID. Well, he does. But he's okay. He's through the hump. He is, his uh, little flu-like symptoms persisted, so he said, well, I better go get tested. He got tested. Uh, the results came back, and he is positive, but he's, he's doing well. I mean, he's, he's, he's over it, you know, basically, but just kind of his absence is because we want to be cautious, you know, and make sure that nobody gets uh, infected with this thing. So, so here we go. Let's get into this real quick. Uh, if you have a bulletin, go ahead and open it up. Something that's not in your bulletin, you will see uh, that we mentioned. Actually, it is at the bottom. But we have these cool flyers now that Savannah so graciously put together for us, uh, for the guys for the Deep South Men's Conference going up at Calvary Chapel, Lexington. Uh, Pastor Ben Falour in the back is a point of contact, and his information's at the bottom. Uh, it gives you the information on cost and carpooling and and that sort of thing. And if you want um, even more detailed information on the actual conference itself, when you get there, there are flyers out there as well for that. There are three-part flyers, a bifold, so, um, or trifold, I guess that would be. But pick up one of those guys if you're interested in going. There is a sign-up. Uh, if you have questions about it, speak to Ben. Uh, he can fill you in better on the details of these things. Uh, looking in your bulletin, you will see uh, this week at Calvary, we have our, our Bible studies and our uh, things going. Some are Zoom, some are actually in person, our home fellowships. Uh, make yourself available to those things. It's, it's really good for encouragement. You know, whether it's by Zoom or by, by whatever, you know, we, we need to be together to encourage one another, especially during this time, all the time, but especially during this time that we're going through. Because, you know, there's uncertainty out there. There's, there's mixed information that comes you know, uh, from, from the experts, you know, we, 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 get, we get things all over the place on this, this whole uh, pandemic thing. So be encouraged. God is still in control, you know, and encourage one another. We're told to encourage one another even as we see the day approaching. And who sees the day approaching? By show of hands. Amen. So encourage one another. Be an encouragement to the body of Christ. Because I tell you what, in, in these times where we're at right now, there is no better time than to be a light in the darkness, than to shine the light of your love, the light that you receive through Jesus Christ, this lost and dying world. Because I feel the day is approaching quickly, quite personally. So, and I'm sure you do too. But, but just be encouraged and encourage one another through these Bible studies and these uh, you know, the, the, the meetings that we can have, and even take someone for a cup of coffee. I'm kind of getting off track here, but, but it's all about encouraging one another. That's what we need to do as the body of Christ, is encourage one another. Amen? All right, let's continue on. Uh, under what's happening at Calvary, you'll see uh, middle school movie night and game nights coming up this Friday uh, next door at the tree. They're going to be watching this movie, The Iron Giant, and if you're old as me, you probably watched it with your kids long time ago. Uh, but Pat, uh, Joel Robinson is the uh, point of contact for that. Also coming up this Saturday at 10 a.m., we're doing the uh, Somebody Cares Tampa Bay's Annual Care Fest 2020. It's going to be a, um, we're, we're going to be mowing lawns and, and uh, actually there's just one, I believe, right? Just one house we're going to. We need at least three guys there. I'm not sure if we need to bring our own lawn equipment or if there's some, of, say again? Okay, the homeowner has all the lawn equipment. Someone asked me that this morning. That's why I'm saying that. But, but um, show up. We just need the manpower there to get things done for them and just to be a blessing. Um, and there's a sign-up actually out there in the lobby. Or you can reply to my email if you're on my men's email list that I sent out this week. Amen. 
All right, moving on. Blood drive coming up next Sunday, 9 a.m., 12. You do need to go to this uh, email address or this website address here and make a reservation. They're not taking walk-ins. Uh, that caught us off guard last time. We set this up uh, a couple of months ago, and no one was able to go and give blood because we didn't know we had to make reservations. But during this time, they're not taking any walk-ins. So make sure you do that if you want to give blood. Uh, I think you're getting a blanket if you donate blood. What's that? Two pairs of socks. <laughs> yes. Are they red with a little blood drop on them? Or? Okay. <laughs> well, you get a prize. <laughs> so if you want to do this, make sure you go to the site. It's actually a really worthy cause. I mean, it's something that, that we should all be doing if we're able to do it. Not everyone can do it, but if you're able, you know, uh, make sure you make yourself available for that. Uh, high school go-kart night is coming up Friday, October 2nd. Wow, the youth are busy. Uh, that's going to be at the uh, Tampa Bay Grand Prix of Clearwater. That looks really cool. So if you have youth age kids, again, contact Joel Robinson for more details. And there's also a flyer out there on the table. Uh, Men's First Wednesday Lunch is something we've started doing here uh, uh, monthly. It's going to be October 7th at noon here in the church building. You bring your own lunch. You can bring stuff to share if you want to, but we're going to fellowship together. Just encourage one another again. Uh, you can contact the church office for that. It's going to be at noon here. Uh, there's a booklet uh, put together by Randy Houston on a, course, a class that he did for our adult ed. And you guys know about that a spiral bound out there on the table. It's $19. Or you can go and look up uh, on our website and, and link to the PDF file, and you can download it for free. So if you want it on your bookshelf, 19 bucks. If you want to read it and keep it on your iPad or whatever, it's free. Uh, and we already spoke about the 2020 Deep South Men's Conference, so we'll put that away. And I will welcome my sister, Vanessa. I want to always call you Vanessa Co., but it's Vanessa Saul now. And I think of her more as a daughter than a sister because she's been here for a long time. I'm going to start crying. Stop it. <laughs> she's now serving over in Africa and Kenya with her husband, Corey. Raise your hand, Corey. And Randy and Carrie saw, and Casey and Dennis. Wafula. Uh, Wafula. Wafula. Uh, they're over there as well. And it's just a whole saw compound there, really, isn't it? <laughs> but she's going to update us on what's going on. Thanks, Pastor. You'll welcome Dan. her. Do you need this chair? No. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, church. How are you today? So if we were in the village in Kisi, Kenya, I would have greeted you like this, Bwakile, and you would have said, Bwakile Buya. So everybody practice, ready? Bwakile Buya. Okay, great, so Bwakile. You guys rock, thanks so much. So I bring greetings again from our church home in uh, Kababe, Kenya. So this little village on the side of a mountain, uh, my mother and father-in-law have been serving there for eight years now starting with discipleship and um, going out and doing inductive Bible study classes, which eventually turned into a ministry um, involving hens, which I'm sure you've heard about um, as an outreach to those that were struggling with alcohol and addiction in the community, um, and an opportunity for them to come out of that and then have um, purpose after they finished um, their time in a U-turn program. And so you heard a little about U-turn from my husband last time he spoke. Um, so really, I just wanted to give you a brief update on what's going on in Kenya, um, and then also just first to bring you gratitude and much appreciation. Uh, we feel the prayers of our church body. We feel the uh, encouragement as you just send little notes or as you give. Um, it blesses us tremendously as we try to serve this village the way that the Lord is calling us to. So. Um, a quick announcement, we had a baby before we went to Kenya, and we're having another one. Um, so the really neat thing is that my sister-in-law, who is married to our pastor there, um, had a baby when at the same time we did two days earlier, and she also is having another one now. So that's a prayer request. Um, we'll both be delivering in Kenya. So if you could please just be praying for safety and just opportunity for us to be sharing the love of Christ as we are meeting um, different healthcare workers and, and um, those that are just involved in the front lines like many of you are here. 
So that's our little announcement. Um, so I wanted to mention a couple things with regards to the ministries we have going on. So at the beginning of the school year, which starts in January, I thought going there, brand new baby, I would just be involved in school and going everywhere with a baby strapped to my back and I thought this is gonna be great. And if you've had a baby um, or experienced you know, any relationship to that, you know that it doesn't move so quickly like that. And the Lord showed me very clearly that I had a ministry to my family and a ministry to um, the immediate community, so those neighbors around us that I could interact with because I had a newborn baby. Um, so just one quick encouragement. Maybe the Lord has led you in a direction and now he's showing you right now I have purpose for you in this way. Let him just continue to open that up to you. Um, because sometimes we think we've got this purpose and so we're going to just jump in and yes, Lord, I want to do whatever you're calling me to. And we think it looks like something. And sometimes it's a season of training or a season of growing or a season of just one on one ministry. Um, a lot of surprises come, some difficult, some great. And we don't know, you know, what the Lord has in front of us. But praise the Lord. He knows he's gone before us. He covers from behind and he fills us. Um, so what I was able to do was spend a lot of time in prayer and um, pray with our worship leader, who also is our children's ministry director. So you can pray for him. His name is Levy. He takes on a lot of responsibilities. He loves our kids. These are, this isn't his village. He's come from a different area. Um, and he's come and he's just poured himself out. And that's his constant. He just desires to be filled by the Lord and poured out um, in ministry. And so please be lifting Levy up as he's trying every opportunity he can to serve. So what happened with schools were we were doing our tutoring program, and then in March, when things were going a little bit awry here, uh, things immediately shut down there. So schools got closed, and um, unlike the potential for online learning here, there was no way our village did not have the resources. Our kids and families barely have enough to put food on the table and clothe their children, let alone you know pay for um, devices and internet. and. And the system itself was just very broken. And so we just have prayed for opportunities one-on-one -on -one with kids, um, inviting them to come and use the library in our house or come and meet us for a tutoring session just one-on-one -on -one because we wanted to abide by the rules that the government had as well. And we weren't sure what was going on either. So one thing you can pray for is our kids have been out of school since March and they won't return until January. And when they return, they'll start the school year again. And we have no idea as to what that's gonna look like. Um, because they do not have the space, um, the technology, to be able to run some of the things that we're trying here. And so please be praying for the kids as that transition will be very, very different. And the education system is already very broken, so um, we could just ask for you to join us in prayer there. Also, um, due to the limitations on movement and um, people have not been able to work just like here and so we've had the opportunity to do a food outreach and um, far-reaching ministries with West Bentley um, supported us in being able to put food bags together and so our U-turn guys went out in teams with guys um, from our church and they went to different houses that they knew were there were needs and they just spread that and spread that and we now have a new believers class that's starting with p families that have never been to church before. And if they have, they've never been to a church that teaches the word. And so please be praying, we've got, there was, if you've seen any pictures of our Hadithi huts, which are about maybe the size of this portion of the stage, it was filled, packed with young and old that have never had the opportunity to know the love of Christ the way that we do. So please be praying for that opportunity and our pastor Dennis, who's also my brother-in-law. Um, this is a huge, um, exciting thing that, we, that he goes into very prayerfully. Everything he does is just very prayerful. And so just be joining us, please, in that. And then also for my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, that um, as they're reaching out to the men and women um, in the community that we serve already and that they've been laboring with for eight years, that, you, that the Lord would fill them with um, a continued steadfastness. Because I'm gonna tell you, just like here, we go through different seasons and there are, there are those that are struggling that maybe have walked with them for a while. And now they're either backslidden or they're just challenged. And so my, my mother and father-in-law, Carrie and Randy, um, are burdened for them, um, but it's also very challenging, just like it is if you have a family member or a friend who's backslidden or um, just ha having struggles there. So just pray for their hearts. They wanna finish well. Um, that's our desire here as Calvary Chapel. I know that, I know, and I love our family for that. Um, so just be, be in prayer for them, please, in that. And then um, also in that, 
um, the unity of our team because we have U-turn going on, I have education going on, we have the outreach with um, the church members, we have all these different things. It's like we're all, you know, in a family, but we're all working in different places and then just having the Lord just continue to draw us together and mainly with communication because we are all coming from different experiences of life and different um, circumstances. And so being able to communicate clearly the way that the Lord would desire us to um, so that the, th that can be used. Um, I did want to share with you just a little story. Oh, one more prayer request, please. Um, tomorrow, my mother-in-law and father-in-law are trying to renew their visas. So they've been active with this for, gosh, I want to say it's been since we got back in January. Um, and with COVID and everything going on, there's just been challenges and challenges. And so they, um, if they can't get their visas renewed, they'll have to leave the country um, for a set amount of time. And they can't just go to the neighboring uh, country. There are certain countries that are within a certain group that they're not allowed to be a part of because that's what the count says. And you have to leave, stay out for a while, and then return. So that would take away from a lot of the things that the Lord has going on there. So please, um, tomorrow they're going to be um, going and seeking out the, the visa renewal. Um, so just a quick story. I think I have a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to share about just encouraging you in, in uh, just like I was saying earlier, you know, sometimes we think that the Lord is directing us in a certain area, and he is, but he has a purpose for us that we didn't know there yet, you know, and he's going to do something in us. And so what's really cool is there's this um, man named Julius, and he went through our U-turn program. Prior to our U-turn program, he was uh, attending university for education in social studies um, and in Christian religion education. And so he, while he was there, he, he fell, he struggled with alcohol addiction. Um, he came to our U-turn program and has shown himself so faithful. When Corey shared, he talked about the, the you know, the, sa the sad guys, you know, that were in the um, cave with David. And I've just watched, it's been one of the coolest things um, in ministry for me to be able to watch my husband minister to these sad guys that have come in into the cave of Adullam. Here they are, and now they're being equipped to be the mighty men um, that the Lord has made them to be, right? He's created us for good things, for good works, before the foundation of the world, you know? And so Corey's had the privilege to serve with, to learn with and grow with these, these guys, these one sad guys. And um, we've had the opportunity to see several of these guys just become um, just steadfast, uh, humble, strong men that came in broken and prideful and um, hurting, you know? And so one of the guys' name is Julius, and he was uh, studying education. I didn't know this when I met him. We watched him for eight months just working hard. It didn't matter what job you gave him. It was like the most important job that anybody could have. And he took such pride in it, and he uh, was a good leader to the young guys that came in, especially our street boys that came in. He was like on them, you know. Um, and so anyhow, he had been just going through, and um, Corey does a, like a leadership group with his uh, overseers, and he has a meeting with them every week, and they study um, in the Word together. And he was in Nehemiah, and he was sharing with the guys about how, um, you know, Nehemiah had this burden for the wall to be rebuilt back um, in his hometown, and the Lord had just quieted his heart to just pray. The Lord, you know, he, he didn't spontaneously just go to the king and say, I need to go now. There's this urgent need, you know? And so um, then, if you know, if you know the story in Nehemiah, the king comes to Nehemiah and asks him, you know, you look burdened, what's going on? And that's when he's able to present his petition um, after he prays. And then um, the king, you know, says, whatever you need, you know, go. And so anyhow, they had been studying Nehemiah and this is going on. And I didn't know this, but I had been praying. Well, I knew this part because I was praying. But I was praying for somebody to come alongside me because of having the baby, I couldn't be a part of everything I wanted to be a part of. And so just praying for somebody to be a part of the education side of things that could really be there 100% of the time. And I could be on the side of praying and planning. And um, so for months I've been praying about this and just really burdened. And um, little did I know, Julius had sought out the opportunity to come and serve with um, Levy, our children's ministry leader, before everything closed down. So he had been praying. Well, then Corey just approached him one day after Corey and I and um, my mom had talked, and he said, you know, um, I just want to know, like, where were you at with education? What was going on? You know, what's your heart? And, and just tell me about your schooling. And so he told him about the university. We figured out it cost about $3,000 for him to finish university. 
um, to get an education degree. And um, so he's just listening. He's like, okay. And he said, well, I just want to let you know that we are, you know, praying about an opportunity here for you to maybe come and serve with us, and maybe we could help you with education, you know, and finishing your program. And he just sat there silent. And he's not exactly a man of many words, but he's not exactly a silent man either. So he sat there silent, and Corey's like, okay, you know. And so the next day, um, Julius came and sought Corey out and said, it took everything within me not to jump up and down praising the Lord because I had been praying about serving with the children here. And the Lord put it on my heart, wait, be patient, let, you know, let, me, let them approach you, you know, let, let me show you that. And so that was such affirmation for Julius and affirmation for us, you know, that the Lord would open those doors, you know. And so I just want to challenge and encourage you that there might be, you know, you might be seeing a need, and so lift it to the Lord. You know, you might be seeing a pressing need in circumstances, um, health, family, finances, work, lift it to the Lord and allow the Lord to, you know, do that work. And then my final things, I think I have four more minutes, um, is um, during all this time, you know, here I am, I have a newborn baby, I'm tired all the time, and then I'm just struggling. I'm struggl I've walked with the Lord since 96, and I'm just struggling with just my thoughts and my emotion and the heaviness of things and how I can't sleep and all this stuff. Um, and my husband is so good and so gentle and, um, and a wonderful listener to the Lord. And so when he saw this, he was like, okay, sit in my office with the word. I'm going to take the baby now, and we're just going to go. And you just sit in, in the word. And at that time, I was in Romans. And, you know, Romans is such an amazing, amazing book for our faith and for our, our living and there were so many things in Romans where it's like, oh, I know this, and it's exciting, but I'm just burdened, I'm heavy, you know, I'm weighed down. And um, so then I was, that day I was in Romans 15, and so in Romans 15, 13, it says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that verse stood out to me so much, I challenge you just to, to stay in it, let the Lord reveal it to you and open it up, because at that moment, I wasn't feeling feeling the, the hope of my God. I wasn't feeling joy and peace. I wasn't believing in the things that the Lord had called me to, the things that he has taught me in his word, things that I know from cover to cover. And guys, I want to just encourage you that, and it says, oh, it's so good, abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to fill me and dwell me if I allow him, if I open myself up, if I let myself be encouraged. You know, Paul often says, um, take courage. And that means be willing to be encouraged because it's so easy to just say, oh, no, my circumstances, my health are, are difficult, challenging. I'm suffering and just stay there. And the word is telling us, the Holy Spirit is telling us, take courage, which means allow yourself to be encouraged. Allow yourself to be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, one last closing thought. I was a math teacher, and that's what I mainly do when I'm in Kenya. And the one thing I love about math is that it, there's absolute truth. There's foundations that build all these other things, and it's absolute truth. So no matter how I feel about it, if I like it, I don't know how many people like math. If I enjoy it, I enjoy it. But I don't know if you enjoy it. It's still true. There's nothing you can feel about it that's going to change it. And that's why I love the word of God. Because I can feel all kinds of things, and we all do, especially this season. I can, we've been watching from, you know, Kenya, what's, how the things have been going on here, and just, I can only imagine what it feels like every day, you know? We can feel whatever we want to feel about it. Even if I don't feel like I believe it, it's still true. Nothing changes it. This foundation will not break. And so my circumstances, they're going to change. They're going to be challenges, and there's going to be highs and lows. My feelings highs and lows, right? My heart is deceitful and wicked. Pastor Brett always talks about how your heart can make a convert of your mind, you know? What you feel can change what you, the reality of what's in your mind, but the fact is the truth doesn't change. So just implore you to allow yourself to take courage, be encouraged, um, and just continue to know that we are praying for you guys. We love you guys. We love this church. Even if we don't know you personally, we know that you've been a part of supporting us in, in different ways, and we are so thankful. And so my husband and I are getting ready to return with our little family in October, um, October 3rd. So we just ask for you just continue to lift us up and know that we are lifting you up with thanksgiving thank, over and over. And we love you. Thank you.
Okie dokie. So, today we're going to pick up where we left off in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Uh, I believe we're at, yes, I know we were in verse 15. But let's go ahead and pray before we get started. Father, we do uh, thank you for just the amazing report from Kenya. Lord, we thank you for what you put on Vanessa's heart, Lord, to share with us. Lord, we know that that comes from you. Father, where we can look at our circumstances and, 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 and basically freak out at times, Lord, but we know that you're in control. Lord, nothing moves you from that position of rule and authority, Lord. So, Lord, as, as we uh, go through the time that we're in, as we go through your word here today, Father, I pray that we would just get that. We would understand that, Lord, so that we can look at this and rejoice, Father. We can look at your word and know the truth that it is, Father. It's not changing. You're the same yesterday as you are today, as you will be tomorrow. You, you do not change, Father. And we're so thankful for that constant, Lord, that understanding that we get when we read your word, Father. So be with us today as we go through this, Lord. Empower me with your spirit, Lord, to teach this, uh, what you've put on my heart, Lord, and give us all ears to hear and a heart to understand what you would say to your church. Lord, we just praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are in John chapter 1 and verse 15 again. Uh, and, and if you'll recall, you know, I, I mentioned that John the writer uh, he, he, he's written this gospel inspired by the Holy Spirit uh, to prove to you and I and the whole world, really, who Jesus Christ is, you know, who he is, who is this, this man, Jesus Christ, that the world really knows of, but they do not know. And, and that's the purpose of this gospel. It, it's, it, it's, it's to prove that, that he is the promised Messiah, uh, to Israel, that, that he is God, very God, our Savior. He is the one that, that we look to for our salvation. That's what John's writing this for. And, and again, he's presenting his case by bringing witnesses to this truth. And John the Baptist here, where we're going to pick up in verse 15, is, is the first witness he called. And verse 15 starts and says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, John the Baptist, if you don't know, was a cousin to Jesus. Uh, and, and he was born before Jesus, about a half a year or so before Jesus was actually born, if you, if you remember the account. But John affirms here, he says that, that he is preferred before me, for he was before me. So his testimony is rooted in his understanding that Jesus came before that Jesus came from old. You know, Jesus was here before him in every sense of the word. So in verse 16, continuing, he says, And of his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. Now, we sang about this grace for grace in, in several of our songs, and, and Vanessa shared about the grace of God. You know, and, and it's this grace. He says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And in verse 14 above that we read last week, it says, uh, John says, We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John said we beheld that. He, he was an eyewitness, the writer of this gospel. I was an eyewitness to this grace and truth in Jesus Christ. He beheld that. Now John the Baptist here is bearing witness of this, that the law came by Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we needed that grace. What he's saying is that in this new order, that grace is inexhaustible. It's an inexhaustible supply of grace. He's saying grace for grace and truth. And he's contrasting that with the order of the law. You know, this, this law, these rigid laws and regulations through Moses that, that no one can successfully navigate. We just can't do that on our own. We can't. We can, we can try. That's the goal, isn't it? The law. But, but we, there's no way that we can successfully navigate that law and follow it completely. That's why we need grace. That's why we need Jesus Christ. That's why the cross is so important to, to who we are as believers. Because without the blood of Christ, we are hopeless. 
We are lost. There's nothing we can do to accomplish what we need to do to be in the presence of the Lord. And notice what he says here. It, it, we've received this grace. And, and look what it says at the beginning of verse 15. In his fullness. Again, what Vanessa was saying, and, and she's stealing some of my thunder. But, but, but it's cool. It's in his strength. It's in his fullness that we receive this grace. It's not in ours. There's nothing that I can do to make that happen. There's nothing that I can do or ever have that compares to his grace. It's in his fullness, this grace. It's in his fullness that we receive it. And we don't deserve it. We don't deserve that grace. This fullness or grace for grace has the idea of, of grace that's inexhaustible. It, it's, it's grace that replaces grace, that replaces grace, that replaces grace, that replaces grace, and on into infinity. You cannot exhaust God's grace. Now let that sink in for a little bit. Because I know, I know who I am. And I know that I follow my sword. I know that I screw up royally from time to time. I know that. And why is that? It's because we're living in this flesh, man. And we're living in this world. And, and, and this world screams at our flesh. And our flesh says, well, I want to be satisfied in, in whatever your poison is. Whatever it is. And it looks to trip us up. And yet the Lord's grace is inexhaustible. You get that? Do you read that like I do? I mean, can you see that in, in, in the scripture here? And, and why do we need this grace? Because God created us to fellowship with him. That is exactly why you're created. If you ever wonder, Lord, why did you create me? It was to fellowship with him. But we screwed that up in the garden, didn't we? Through Adam, man. And we've been struggling with that ever since. We've been struggling with that sin. Why? Because sin separates us from God. Our sin separates us from God. We, it, it, the light cannot be in the presence of darkness and vice versa. We, we just we can't do it. So we need this grace. In Isaiah it says in verse 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that you cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your sin has separated you from your God. Sin always has that effect of separating us from God. And you guys know the story. You, you guys know. When I do something boneheaded, man, I feel so distant from God. I, I, I feel so distant from him. And, and it's like, man, I, I can't believe that happened. But, but God does not separate himself from us. We separate ourselves from him, you see. And, and the point is, is he's always there. It's that grace upon grace upon grace. It's inexhaustible. All we have to do is turn to him and, and just say, sorry, Lord. And he doesn't push us away. Seems like I say that every time I get up here. <laughs> but he doesn't, man. He wants fellowship with you. That's the very reason that you were brought into this world. It's a fellowship with God. Man. That's what we were created for. Verse 18 continues. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, listen to this, He has declared Him. And this word for declared, it, 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 it means He manifested Him, or He led forth into full revelation. He's revealed Him. Jesus, the Word, is the perfect declaration of of God the Father. He is the unseen God. He is declared in the nature of Jesus. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus in the Bible. If you want to know his character, read about it. If you ever wonder about the nature of God, read about it in the Word. Follow the writings of Jesus. Follow what the Word says about God, because this is God's voice speaking here, right? All Scripture is God-breathed. I say that all the time, too. I want us to get it, man. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in the Word so we can understand the, the character and the nature of God, and, and, and we can understand who He is. And we can do that. We, we, can, we can be encouraged by reading it for ourselves. Just like Vanessa, again, and I'm sorry I'm using it for example, but, but, but just like she said, she sat down in a quiet moment and opened Scripture. 
You know how often God speaks to me in that time? When I can get along by myself with the word and, and, and just go through. And, and, and it's not everything. You know, I, I, I can read through this at, at, at some point and I can read through it at another point. And, and the one time I, I, I might not get the same thing out of it, but another time, man, I'll read through and read a verse and man, it's just like, boom. It's that big old hammer from the Lord. He says, this is what I want you to get. You know, and I get it. And it's like, wow, that's encouraging. It's what I need in the moment. You know, the Lord is faithful in that. He will encourage your hearts. Please stay in the word. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, for he has declared God, very God. Now, the Bible says that no man can look at God and live. Now, when Moses asked God, he said, I'd like to see you, God. What did God say? Well, you can't see me and live. But stand in the cleft of the rock here, and you can see the glow as I pass by. Don't look at me, though. And when Moses did that, and he was up on the mountain and saw the glow of God pass by, and he came down off that mountain, his face was glowing. And the people around him said, Moses, we can't stand to look at you. Put something on that, man. And he had to cover his face with a veil till the glow went away. Now, why is that? Because in our flesh, you see, in, in this body that we have, this flesh is earthy. It's of the world. We, we in, in, in our flesh, we have sin, right? In our flesh, we're, we're subject to that sin. We're, 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 we're subject to the influences of the world that are all around us, you know. And, and in this body, we cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. We can't do it. Why? Because it would be trying to like, like trying to stand in, inside a nuclear explosion. You would dissolve. Your body would just vaporize because you cannot stand in the righteousness of God. We can't do that. But one day we will. Praise God. I can't wait for that day. I am so ready for that day, man. I am so tired of all the stuff that's going on out there. One day we will be in his presence. And that day is coming soon, I believe. I believe it's coming soon. But we're only getting a glimpse of him now. We're, you know, Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13 that, that we're, we're looking in a mirror dimly. You know, we're, we're, we're only looking at a glimpse. At the, the, the beauty that we see of God through the word of God and, and, and through our experience with the Lord as we fellowship with one another, as we encourage one another, as we sing praises to his name, as, as we do that, even that beauty, such the encouragement that it is, that's only looking through a glass darkly. That's only just a, 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 a reflection of who he is. We cannot see him face to face, but one day we will. In that same book, in 1 Corinthians, that same letter to the Corinthians, Paul says in verse 15, he says, or chapter 15, he says, he says that this corruption must put on him corruption. What's the corruption? It's our flesh. Because our flesh will see corruption, right? What happens when you die? You rot. And you see corruption. Right? This corruption, this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal put, must put on immortality. And when that happens... When that time comes in a blink of an eye, in an instant, when we're face to face with the Lord, man, we'll, we'll be in that, that heavenly body that God fashioned with his own hands. We'll be in his presence and we'll be able to stand there and look at him face to face. And we'll be able to behold his glory in, in all of its righteousness and in, in everything that it is. And man, we're going to be blown away by that. I'm blown away by it by just thinking about it. But Paul even says that we, that we can't even think or imagine what reality is going to be. It's hard to wrap our head around. Because we have, we have no concept of it this side of heaven. We have no concept uh, other than what we read. But yet, even reading this, we're only catching a glimpse of it. You get that, right? Man, we're in, we're in his presence. That's when it's going to be amazing. Verse 19, we'll continue here. It says, now, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now, John was down there at the River Jordan. He was down there baptizing the multitudes of people that came from Judea and Jerusalem. They were all coming down. He was a popular guy. 
You know, he's dressed in camel hair, you know, and he, and he, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Oh, let's go see this guy. You know, it, that was his shtick, you know, he had this thing. And we're going to all go see. And, and when they got there, man, they were hearing the truth from him. He was baptizing. He was very popular. People were drawn to him. Maybe at first, you know, they, they heard, well, hey, let, let's go watch this crazy guy down by the river. But when they got there, they heard the words of God. They, they heard this, this teaching, you know, and it's like, wow. Who is this he's talking about? And they were led to the water. They were baptized. So the priests were saying, well, what is he doing? Who is this guy anyhow? Let's find out. We're going to send our emissaries down. So they did. And they sent them down to ask the question, just who are you? And by what authority are you baptizing these people? What gives you the right, man? That's our job. We're the one in the fancy robes and the pointy hats. You know, why, why, are, you, why are you doing this? You're stealing our thunder. <laughs> So they came down, and verse 20, he confessed, and he did not deny but confess. So that means he emphatically denied. He said, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now, this is very interesting here, and if, if you're a student of the Word, you probably have it all figured out, but if you're not, I'm going to share this with you. It's, it's interesting here when they ask him, are you Elijah? And he said, no. Now, before his birth, if you know the account of, of, of the birth of John the Baptist, his father, Zacharias, was a priest, and the lot fell on him to offer uh, uh, offerings to the Lord, you know, to go in before the Lord. And, he, and, and when he went in there, he met the angel Gabriel. Now, this is in Luke chapter 1, if you want to read it. But, but Gabriel announced to, to Zacharias. Now, Zacharias was an old guy, and his wife was very old, and they never had any children. So first of all, he says that your prayers have been heard. So obviously, they had been praying for a child, right? So he goes in there, and, and, he, and he says, you're going to have a son. Gabriel said that, announced that. To him, you're going to have a son, and, and you're going to name him John. And there's a lot more to that story. If you want to read it, do it for yourself. But, but Gabriel also said this to John, and this is where maybe some confusion might come in. He says, John would go out in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, that sounds just like what the, the, the prophecy in Malachi says, Right? Prophecy in Malachi says basically the same thing, you know, but it's not. At least it's not fully the same thing. That, that Elijah that he spoke of in Malachi would be the forerunner of the Messiah in the kingdom age. So the Jews would have been looking for Elijah, or for Elijah to come. So that's why they're asking him, are you, are you Elijah? And they're still doing that today. Gabriel said he would go out in the spirit and power of Elijah. He would not be Elijah. But the spirit and the power, a type of the actual coming of Elijah before the second coming of the Lord spoken of in Malachi. So when asked if he was Elijah, he truthfully he said, no, I'm, I'm not Elijah. That's not who I am. In other words, I'm not here to fulfill that prophecy. That's not my purpose is to fulfill that prophecy uh, that's going to set up the kingdom age. But he, yet he was here in the spirit and power of Elijah as a forerunner of Jesus. And Jesus spoke about that in Matthew 11. But Elijah the prophet will come. And, and you know, it, if, if you're a student of the word in Revelation 11, you'll see it. And you can read of the two witnesses in there. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that one of those witnesses is Elijah. So you can read that for yourself. But then in verse 21, again, uh, the second part of that, they say, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Well, what does that mean? The prophet. What prophet? Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, uh, it says this, Moses prophesied this. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And when they came to John the Baptist and they said, are you that prophet? Are you the prophet? They were referring to this prophecy. And, and, and the Jews, even today, believe that this prophet is the Messiah, but they don't believe that this prophet that Moses spoke of is God. Even on this day, they don't believe that their Messiah is God, the Son of God. They believe their Messiah is, is a man of flesh and blood, like Moses, risen up from Israel. 
That's what they believe. But Peter, in his message in Acts chapter 3, in verse 22, he says that this prophecy was concerning Jesus Christ, that this prophet was the Messiah. He was Jesus Christ. And then they said, are you that prophet? He answered, no. Verse 22, then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those sent to us? What do you say about yourself? Now, we've been here to find out. Now we have to go back and tell our bosses who you are. Who are you? We need to know. And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Verse 23, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I'm the voice of one in the wilderness. I've come to tell you to make straight the way of the Lord. I've come to tell you the king is coming. So he said, that's what I am. I'm just gone before him to tell everybody that he's on the way. Now, it's interesting, back in those days, if you're a student of history or the word, you know that when a king was coming into town or coming into a region, he had these people that would go out before him and they would tell the city or whatever he was coming in, make sure you smooth out all the bumps, make sure you take care of everything that, that's, that's going on so the king would have a smooth ride into the city and not be jostled about, right? How can we relate that to us? We can re relate that spiritually. You know, this time that we have, this side of heaven, this is so we can smooth off the rough edges, right? This is so we, we, we can prepare for our eternity with the Lord. We're here on this side of heaven, and, and, and yeah, we might bump into one another, you know, as, as stones bump in and knock off the edges, those sort of things. We're, we, we might do that. But if we go through the Word and we read the Word of God, man, He can soften our heart to things. He can open our eyes to things. He can allow us to be used by him in ministry, which is what we should be doing anyhow. We should be encouraging one another. He can smooth out those rough places. Amen? That's what we need to be doing right now. This is, this is, this is school time. Not just right here, but our entire life, man. We're learning to be like Jesus, to identify with Jesus, to be one with Christ, so that we can show the world who he is through who we are. That's, that's what we're doing. We're, we need to smooth out the rough places, prepare things. The king is coming. Verse 24 continues. He says, now, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And Jesus, uh, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you, whom you do not know. Now, you guys need to underline that in your Bible. And he says, is, is he, it is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, or Bethany, as some translations read, beyond the Jordan and where John was baptizing. Now, what's interesting here to me, and why I said underline that, is that, you know, as far back as Moses, they're looking for their Messiah, right? They're looking for their Messiah. And they weren't even, they, they were even aware of the arrival of Jesus and of the signs of the Messiah's birth. You know, and, and you can look in, in, in Matthew 2 as the scribes, you know, demonstrated that. They, they, they said when, when Herod asked, you know, where's the king to be born? Where, where's this, Je or not Jesus, but where's the Messiah to be born? And they said in Bethlehem. They knew. They were aware of these things, yet they missed it, man. They missed it all. And for most of the world, that's a sad truth today, isn't it? For most of the world, you know, we, we, we miss it. The world has missed the coming of Jesus. And he's there. He's playing for everyone to see. And, and, and yet, most of the world missed it. Most of the world walks in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness or the hardness of their hearts. That's the problem. We're selfish in our flesh. Our hearts can become hardened so easily. I mean, you, you look outside these doors. You watch the news or read the Internet. Man, it, it, if, if your heart isn't hardened because of that, you know, praise God, but don't be jaded. Don't let your heart be so hardened that you're useless, that you miss Jesus. Because it's not about you and your comfort. 
It's not about you and your bank account. It's not about you and your help. It's not about you and your relationships. It's not about you and anything like that. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified, man. And that's what we got to be sharing with the world. The world needs to see that. They need to see him, not us. Because where we're at right now, this is temporal. This is all going to burn. You guys know that. This is going to dissolve and pass away, man. But, but where we're going, where we're heading is eternal. And that's what we need to be looking at. That's what the world needs to see. They need to see the hope that is in you, not the, not the dread and the doom. And, and, oh, my gosh, who's going to be elected? God knows who's going to be elected. Leave it at that. Vote your whatever's on your heart, but let God make the decision because it's his to make, and he will. Don't be fretting about it, man. Whoever is put into office is because the Lord allowed him to be there. That's the truth. That's hard to swallow sometimes, but it's true. I can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. The Lord does everything about it. So that's what we need to do. Verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, now Peter would, in his, uh, later in his first epistle, he said this. He said, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish without spot. Jesus became God's sacrificial lamb to take away our sins once and for all. That's why he came. He came because we were not able to do it. We were not able to fulfill the righteousness of the law. He is our righteousness. That blood that came down from the cross covers us in his righteousness. When the Father looks at you, that's what he sees. If you don't know him, he's looking right at your sin. And the devil's there accusing night and day. And the ones that know him, that are covered in his blood, Jesus says, nope, that one's mine. That one's mine. He's our counselor. He's our intermediary. And so John's proclamation concerning Jesus says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The, the people there, the, the Jews, they were very familiar with lambs being used as a sacrifice for sin offerings. They, they understood that. They were very aware with the, 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 the experience that their forefathers had in Egypt where they took a lamb and, and they spread the blood on the lentils and the doorposts you know, so the firstborn wouldn't be slain. They understood that. They were familiar with that experience. They were very familiar with the sacrificial lambs in order to put away sin. So John's declaration, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, would have made their ears perk up. That would have gotten their attention. They would have said, Wait, what? And they would have gone, Who is that? And they would have looked at him. They would have looked at Jesus. Man, be in there. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being there and, and being able to gaze upon the face of Jesus and be told that here's the Lamb of God? I, I, I hope that I would have been one of those that followed him, one of his disciples, you know. But I don't know. My heart may have deceived me. I, I may have said, who, who is this guy? You don't walked away. But the point is, we know who he is now, you see. We know who he is because we can read the word and, and we can see exactly who he is and what he did and what he came to do. And we can look at that and behold his glory through the word of God. We can understand who he is and what he did through what we read. When we pray and we commune with God on, on those communion days, you know, when, when, we, when we, we, we remember the, the, what the bread and the wine means. We can fellowship with our Lord. And again, it's at a distance. <laughs> Not like COVID. But, but we're at a distance. But one day we're going to be face to face. And there won't be any masks in heaven, I promise you. And we'll be able to... Behold him for who he is.
and what he's done and see the promise and the, and, the, and, the, and the glory that he has in store for all of the believers, man. So John got their attention by saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then in verse 30 he says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. That's all I knew. Therefore, I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness. You hear this? John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John said, I saw the Spirit of God coming down and alighting on the head of Jesus, and it remained on him. And God, who sent him to baptize with water, said, Whoever you see that Spirit coming down on, that is he. That's the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's the one. That's the Messiah, the one we've all been waiting for. In verse 34, and this is where we're going to close. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John says above, he says, these things we write unto you that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So here's the witness, man. John says, I saw and I testify. John the Baptist says, I saw and I testify. This is the Son of God. This is our first witness. Remember I told you last week, you know, as John the Gospel writer, he's going to bring forth witnesses to the stand. This is the first of those. And, and, and what is a witness anyhow? A witness gives testimony to what they've seen or experienced in, a, in, an, in an effort to establish the truth. And, and witnesses are not neutral. They're either uh, 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 committed to the truth and tell the truth of what they saw, or they're an outright liar. They're an unreliable witness. Right? But John was a reliable witness. Why? Because he saw it with his own eyes, man. He saw it. It was not hearsay. I saw and witnessed this, you see. And that's why we need to take notice. That's why when we read these things, we need to understand that, man, these came from eyewitnesses. The Gospels that, that we read through in here, this is not some book of fiction. This is not something that, that, that someone made up on the fly. This is not anything like that. They didn't get together and collaborate and say, all right, what are we going to write to fool the people for 2,000 years? They didn't do that, man. This is truth. And just like math, it doesn't change. It's absolute. You can read in this book, in the Bible, you can read and get the truth. Whereas if you go out there outside those doors or you go on the Internet or on your iPhone or whatever, man, no telling what you're going to get. And I'm not saying the Internet's not useful because it is. But, man, if you want to know the solid truth, the, the absolute truth, go to the Word. See what God says about himself. Don't... don't Bank on other sources giving you the complete truth. God is truth. So you and I, what does that mean for us? Well, that means if, if you fully believe the word of God, if you get this, if, if when you read this, you take it to heart and, 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 and you, you, you fashion your life around it and, and you walk with the Lord in it and, and, and you allow the Lord through his word to correct and, and, and to direct and to smooth out the rough places, you know, because the king is coming, man. If you allow that to happen, well, then you can be a witness for him. And you can be a reliable witness. You can be one that goes out and shares the light of that love that's inside your heart, that hope for all eternity that you have, that you have gleaned from this with a lost and dying world. That's what we're called to be, man. We're called to be a witness for Christ. And he doesn't need you. You get that, right? The whole kingdom's not going to fall because 
you know, Jim didn't go out and share his testimony with somebody or, 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 or encourage somebody or, or, you know, love on somebody that needs it. The world's not, the, the, the he, heaven's not going to cave in because of that. But man, he wants you to be a part of that. Because there's blessing upon blessing. There's blessings that we don't even get, man, that we're going to be able to receive if you can be useful to God in ministry and go out and, and, and do the work of the ministry and encourage others as you see the day approaching. Be in the light and the darkness. Going out on the mission field, you know, whether it's in Africa or it's in your backyard, you know, being that, being that light, man, that the Lord desires you to be so that 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 when when someone comes in and, and they're having a heavy day even an unbeliever and, and they may see you at work or or may see you in the marketplace and man you're just like you know God's in control they can have that peace they might ask you about that man what why aren't you concerned what's going on and, and it's not that we want to be stupid you know nobody I, I, I'm not encouraging anyone to be dumb about you know, being careful and being safe and that thing. But man, don't fret about it. God's still in control. That's what the world needs to see. They don't need to see your frown. <laughs> they need to see the joy that's in you because that joy is contagious. That joy is more contagious than the COVID. You know, you go out and you be... You, you, you be that light in the darkness, man, and you'll see people perk up. You'll see people take attention. Oh, well, wow, why? Because we need to hear it. People need to hear that. They need to hear that there's a hope. They need to hear that there's a promise in the Word. They need to hear that they can get everything they need out of this book right here. You know, they can get everything that they need from Jesus Christ. Because it's not in this world. These things are passing. They're passing fast. Fast. We need to be a witness as John, you know, and, and John was a, a peculiar character indeed. You know, it says he wore uh, camel fur, wild locusts and honey. I'm not saying you need to do that or live in a desert or anything like that, unless, you, unless that's your thing. I mean, if you want to do that, go for it. But I'm saying we need to be a light in the darkness. We need to love on people. We need to encourage people. We need to, to, to just be available to share this love that we have, that we've been given so freely, this, this grace that's been poured out, this grace upon grace upon grace. Man, none of us deserve that. None of us deserve it. We deserve hell. We deserve death. That's what we deserve in our flesh. And apart from Jesus Christ, that's exactly what we would get. And now that we have this grace that's on the cross, man, go out and share it. Be the example. Be a witness for Christ. And, and, and like I always say, I, you know, I'm not talking about beating people up and thumping them over the head with your Bible and those kinds of things. I'm talking about being a light, man. Have that gentle spirit. Have that spirit of hope. Have that grace. That's hard for me. It's hard for me to have grace sometimes. But we need to do it. Because that's what the Lord did. And that's who we're to follow. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we do once again thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we, we, we man, it's so rich. It's so full of, of nourishment for our spirit, Lord. It, it's so full of of the things that we need to survive, Lord. I, I, I pray, Lord, that as we have gone through this little short time, as we've uh, briefly uh, gone through here, Lord, that, that, that we exhausted every ounce of nourishment, spiritual nourishment that we could get out of this, Father. But if not, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts to reread these things, Lord, reread them and just chew on them as a cow chews a cud, Lord, so that so we can get that nourishment that we need from it, Father. Lord, we all need to be strong spiritually, especially in these days, Father. All our life, but especially now, Lord, as we get closer and closer, Lord, help us to be more and more aware of your approaching return, Father, so that we can be more and more aware that we need to be busy about your business. 
Father, when we come, when you come, we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, that's what I want to hear. I want to finish well, Lord. We all want to finish well. We want to do what you desire us to do, Lord. Be that man, that woman of Christ, that woman of God that you created us to be, Lord. That, 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 that man or woman, Father, that, that, that is a light in the darkness, Lord. It's not our light. It's not in our strength, Father. It's in your strength in your spirit, Lord, that we can do these things and that we get to do these things. Not that we have to, Father, but we get to do it because you want us to receive that reward, Father. You want us to be encouraged even through our acts of service to you. Lord, so give us all servant hearts, Lord, as we saw Jesus serve, Father. Give us that heart, Lord, of the Lord that we might be useful in ministry, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, keep Pastor Brett and his family in prayer. And again, they're, they're doing well, uh, but keep them in prayer. And keep this fellowship in prayer. We need to be a light. Amen? All right. Go out and make disciples.